Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Hi, everybody. This is Scott with the Exploring Washington State podcast. And today, my guest is Tana Granick. Um, he is the operations director for the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention in Bellingham. Welcome, Tana. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Scott. Yeah, thanks for thanks for being on, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to finding out more about the museum. Why don't you? Why don't we get started with a little bit of? Tell us the backstory. What's the history there? Uh, about 20 years ago, two lifelong collectors from Bellingham, of all places, uh, uh, married their collections together. Uh, one, uh, one, one's a radio collector who had one of the finest radio collections in the world, thousands of, of radios, particularly from the golden age of radio. The other was interested in early electrical scientific equipment. I mean, Donnie electrical age stuff, Ben Franklin and before, uh, Isaac Newton, Gilbert, uh, telephone, telegraph, uh, uh, and all the scholarship that goes with it. So they married the two together in a large building in downtown Bellingham. And uh, and they wanted to tell the entire story of electrical invention, and so they they got this twenty five thousand foot facility and they filled it with uh, this collection of original artifacts, and uh, we've been busy ever since. That's fascinating, and and that the, they were both in Bellingham and and had these these large collections. So you said golden age of radio. When was the golden age of radio? Oh, uh, you know, people think of the 30s and 40s, uh, you know, the Jack Benny, the big bands, the music. I mean, radio was such a huge, it was just a brand new phenomena, you know, that uh, just just imagine how, how empty your room would be without any, there's, certainly there's no TV, there's no, but to actually have a, a box that has some sound that comes out from somewhere else. It was profoundly, uh, 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 communal liber and liberating and people just and so radio just flourished it started in the 20s the first radio station we have the first radio uh actually the first radio that took the broadcast from the first radio station in 1921 and then within 10 or 15 years again you've got you've got burns and allen and 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 uh 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 uh, Hope and Crosby and Frank Sinatra and the music industry and the whole music industry can you imagine didn't even exist you know so um so that's the golden age of radio and John Winter is a, has the one of the finest collections in in the world uh, and our biggest problem is we have we have a great deal on display but also uh floors and actually outside buildings full of extra equipment that we still have to negotiate and go through so um it's a spectacular collection Okay. Yeah. One of the things I think of when I think of radio is, you know, the uh, war of, it was the war of the worlds at the, the radio show that kind of uh, before my time, but threw everybody into a big panic because they kind of thought it was real. <laughs> and yeah, the, th the whole 1938, you know, the, you know, the Halloween, the whole bit. Yeah. It's, it was, but again, radio is so new. And, uh, uh, if you're, if you're going through the dial, so all of a sudden, here's someone, and they, they did frame it much like a regular radio broadcast. That was the drama of it. And so uh, that, yeah, what, what a phenomenon. But, and, and to be able to reach you know, millions and millions of ho households instantaneously, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a big lesson in the power of this, both good and bad, in this mass communication. So not, not that you know the answer to this, but I'll ask the question, when, when did Bellingham get radio? Well, I would imagine. Well, no, there's some actually some local historians that do a lot of the work with the, with the radio in the early. But I would say it would be in the in the in the uh, late uh, mid to late twenties, twenty six, okay. twenty seven. So within the first decade, it was really probably reaching the yeah. smaller the smaller communities, if you will, of 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 America, because Bellingham wasn't that large of a place back back then. No, um, no. But I can tell you, radio just like electricity. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what the what the whole evolution of how that got out there, but but you can imagine how how important it was to rural areas uh, to be able to get any kind of communication, be able to dial in. So um, so radio stations went up everywhere, I think, pretty quick. Um, but I, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. You you bring up the point that I did I haven't thought about before is you know pre radio. How did you know? How did a rural person 
know what was going on, you know, in New York or Chicago or Seattle or something. I mean, I guess the newspaper. That's right. And but, the, news, um, the newspaper is connected to the Telegraph, right? The right. Telegraph can send a story, but I mean, it's, you know, so, so yeah, no, it's, it, and by the way, it just real, you know, that's kind of the fun of, that's the fun of being here at this museum because, you know, we start with, you know, the early stuff and my job or our job is to take you back in a time when nobody even knew what to call this, this energy, let alone what to do with it. And it's just been a little while. And to watch how things change as people slowly get connected, you know, and, and uh, you know, the Internet was huge. TV and radio was huge, but nothing beats the telegraph. Nothing sewed the country and the planet together better than the telegraph. To be able to get a message, you know, uh, uh, thousands of miles away in, in, a, in a matter of seconds. Uh, that's true. It was just that's a true. whole game. You know, in the old days, if you're the general and you send off the army and you send them off and you wave and then you wait two years to find out who won. Right? <laughs> yeah. like, well, I, you know, good luck. And then maybe somebody will get a message back. But what? You know, you go to you go to England and get a message to the queen. And she says, well, tell them maybe you got to get back on a boat for six weeks. And, you know, you just it's just so communication to be. And, you know, the other thing that's really interesting is because mil the military used this in such a big way early on, obviously, before Galileo turned the telescope up to see the, you know, to really start figuring things out. It was, it was a military weapon. But to be able to see your enemy or know your enemy before your enemy can see or know you, the advantage is obvious and profound. So uh, communication, good and bad, is, you know, for good or bad means, you know, communication, instant communication is changes everything. So Yes, very true, very true. So looking back on the museum's evolution, you're at where you're at today. What do you think the museum's going to look like, say, in five years? You know, it's such a big question, but the the museum is a science and history museum that has demonstrations and exhibits that are accessible to everybody on every level. And if I was going to show anybody, if I had anybody, I said, I got one hour of science to show you in the world, this would be the vehicle and this would be the way I do it. You don't have to know anything about it. It's accessible. It's immediate. Everybody gets it. It's not controversial. I'm not the Darwin Museum. I'm electricity and science, you know, magnetism museum. So it's like it's 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 stuff that we all work with, and so I just see us being a bigger and bigger hub for science education. Okay, that's that's that sounds awesome. That sounds yeah. exciting. Yeah, it is. It is exciting, you know. And so, and that's what we've gone, and that's you know we're on the way. We we did almost twenty thousand visitors before we you know we were we had this unfortunate um, uh, uh, pandemic that's affected everybody. And my our hearts go out to everybody. But uh, and there are a lot of businesses that are in jeopardy, and we certainly, you know, are not happy about not being able to serve the public. But if kids and people need need science education more than ever, and we're the we're the platform for it, so uh, we're just the teachers in the community are just chomping at the bit to, for us to come back. And then the only complaint we get is there's not more of us. You okay, know, you know, and and then there's not more programs, and not more, and so. Um, we feel like we're on the right track. Uh, uh, we feel like we're on the right track, and uh, uh, we've responded to the community. That's another thing is is being the starting out, just loving the museum and the collection, and then you know starting to teach classes and working with kids and and lots of people to everybody. Your grandma, your kids, your your aunt from France who doesn't speak English, you know. Uh, uh, they'll all have a great time and it's such a meaningful time that it just made a great impact on the staff, you know, doing these demonstrations and stuff like, you know, we really have an effect on people. We have to really be serious about this. And, and, and this is fun and exciting, but you know, it's a great platform. And, and, um, and so we, yeah, we just take it all pretty seriously. What, uh, what we do here. Do you ever, um, you mentioned kids, do you ever take parts of the collection to the schools and bring it directly to the kids? You know, it's funny. We, we, we do demonstrations at, at the school sometimes, you know, but, but it's hard to take. That's one thing we learned early on is the, the, the space has become so spectacular, you know, because, you know, I, I was just writing something up about the galleries. We give demonstrations. Docents give demonstrations in all the galleries. 
So here you are surrounded, let's say you're in the static electricity gal uh, exhibit. Well, you're surrounded with the first devices ever used to make, measure, and store electricity, not copies, like pieces from 1650, 1700s. And then in, in the midst of that, some guy is there with a replica, and the kids are all around, and then we can demonstrate that for you. So, so um, uh, there, there's no better place to experience these demonstrations than here. And the other thing is, there's a lot of the bigger equipment just can't be moved, like the mega zapper that four and a half million volts of loose electricity. I just can't put that in a truck and wheel it somewhere. And uh, so what I'm saying is, 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 is there the, a lot of the experience is built into the into the into the museum itself so that if you want to enjoy it as a museum and gosh aren't these wonderful priceless artifacts to admire but then there's the interactives and then there's of course all that we can demonstrate for you and that's that's why with this pandemic you know we're getting ready to, to reopen and when we reopen it's like well our biggest brag is look at all these cool interactives because that's what people want yeah it's great to see a priceless light bulb but <laughs> What does it do, right? So can I interact with some newer things? So we have these interactives that, that bring it all home. And to have telephones you can dial on and telegraph keys you can tap on. Oh, and, very cool. And uh, and theremins to play, you know, and static labs to make your hair stand up and all those things that you expect when you come to this museum, including seeing indoor lightning. And so that's what we're doing with the docents. It's like, guys, if people aren't able to interact with things as much as they used to because people are not into touching like they used to, Right? Nobody wants to put a puzzle together. I got it. So, but that means our job is to give more demonstrations. In other words, we have to be more present with the with people in the galleries, so so that we are demonstrating things for them and giving them a good time and leading them through. So, so we've got that in spades. We've got um, we, we give great dynamic. That's part of our our program is giving dyna uh, dynamic demonstrations in all of the galleries. And plus, we've got the powerhouse where we've got all the big equipment. So um, we're going to, you know, we're just trying, it'll just be a more of an orchestrated show uh, for the okay. time being. Yeah. But uh, so you mentioned a theremin. Of course. Okay. Oh, the world's first electronic musical instrument, the only instrument you play without touching it, the instrument we all know, we've heard many times, we just don't always know it. So when, when was the first one? When did those come out? Um, the patent was from 1919, but the the first one, the RCA theremin, which we have in the galleries, uh, the original, like they, they made 500, I think just 500 of the of of the original RCA theremin, 1929. That was it. We have one on have the play, one. but we also have a couple of newer models for you to play along with. See, that's the deal. There's the scholarship, and then there's this, you know, there's the interactive. So but it became known not as a, a musical instrument, but as a, as a classic sound effect device. Uh, so I was watching a video, and I think you were playing one. Yeah. But it was a Moog? Well, Bob Moog of Moog Synthesizers, you know, so theremin is considered really the first electronic musical instrument manufactured. It's very simple. It's very primitive. I call it kind of the Pong. The pong, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, back, where it's very primitive, like right? volume pitch. Really, that's about it. Just all you can do is get it to make rude noises. A lot of us. It. It's very difficult to play. Well, now, you know, they've got the Moog synthesizers where sound has been synthesized and blended and so, so beautifully. And so the Moog synthesis. So as a tribute to theremin, the Moog company produces, makes theremins today. And they make a souped up uh, theremin called a theremini. And so it, they would be able to incorporate some of the classic Moog synthesizer sounds, uh, the drone and some of those, just very, they're very familiar. Into So you can play a, a Moog synthesizer without touching it the way you played a theremin. It's brilliant. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, you were, what got me is I was watching this video and, and the theremin is just, you're right. I, it, I, I associate with like old science fiction music, movies and, and, and then also Big Bang Theory when when Sheldon played it, so that's kind of my. But then you, I saw this Moog, and I was like, "Well, that's kind of that was cool looking." I mean, that was a. When did that? So it was a you know a white plastic yeah, looking yeah, yeah. it's called sci fi looking thing. It was cool though. It's called theremin. So theremin with an I in the end, 
And yeah, they just, uh, they came out about, we've got a couple of them. I, I have one personally, um, because again, it's, it's, it, it's very versatile. And so it, it'll play the original theremin sound and, and, you know, but then it's got ways to, to adjust the sound. It's got 32, I think, preset classic Moog sounds that you can play and you can play around with the, with the pitch and you can play around with the, with the key and it, it's got a little screen. So it's, it's just the best. And you're right. It's got that sci-fi look very, uh, well, when Bob Moog was talking about a collector's item that we wish we had, when Bob Moog, the you know the founder of Moog synthesizers, uh, we think was just brilliant. We have several of his of his sixties and seventies synthesizers. When he was a little boy, he used to make theremins in his garage when he was fourteen and fifteen and sell them off like in in you know popular mechanics kind of magazines, you know mail order. Can you imagine getting a handmade Moog synth? Uh, uh, Theremin made by Bob Moog when he was 15 in his garage. So uh, that would be, that would be very, very cool. No, so, that's yeah. So Bob Moog is a big fan of Theremin and, and, uh, and as a tribute to him produces a, a version of the Theremin today. So who's credited with inventing the Theremin? Uh, is there an indiv- Yeah. Leon Theremin. Leon Theremin. Leon okay. Theremin's a, a, a Russian physicist and inventor. Uh, he was Russian. He, he, I think he had the patent from 1919, and he came to America in the 20s. And then RCA, again, we have the first one manufactured, the RCA one, 1929. Uh, it's the same two wands, that, you know. And and so, uh, yeah, he, uh, that, and he was responsible for lots of other lots of other craziness as well as life went on. But, yeah, it was Leon Theremin, a famous Russian physicist. Okay. So... So when I was looking at some of the other exhibits, you've got the incandescent light bulbs and we're using them as space heaters because the bulbs aren't very efficient, which, but that seemed intriguing to me that they were building little, like little radiators and putting light bulbs in them. What, what was going on with that? Well, um, from, from what I know about it, I just know that obviously, uh, when we, when you talk about, um, uh, uh, light bulb technology, or the or the history of of uh, artificial light, you know, uh, uh, from street lights. So they're trying to bring light into the home, and they finally, you know, and it's difficult. You know, it's one thing to make an arc light that can light up a street, but to have that that light in your home that's safe and you can have around your kids and the whole thing, it's just like it posed a lot of safety problems. And when they finally when they finally got it. The light bulb was invented, let me back up, in 1800, a guy named Humphrey Davy is running electric current through a wire, and it's really, he's running more and more, and it's getting hotter and hotter, and as the, as the wire gets, it runs more and more current through, it begins to glow, and he runs so much of it through, it glows, he goes, oh my gosh, I run through, I, it gives me light, but way before you get light, you get heat, it makes way more heat than light. It's not efficient. Those light bulbs, you touch them, you burn your hand right away. This is the point. And so these first incandescent bulbs, but they're not really thinking of that kind of efficiency. This heat is a byproduct. And so since they come, give so much heat and it gives light, well, then maybe we can, we can harness and we can focus the heat and use it as heat as well. But it's like it's just not going to – it's not very practical. Not very practical. Well, they were interesting to look at, though, on, on the photos. Well, all, all that stuff, I mean, we've got a little case full of, of just bizarre – you know, let alone the quack medicine and everything, which is another whole areas, but just all the all the home appliances, you know, with this new energy source that this new reason to use electricity, you know. And uh so what was okay, so that's interesting. So they started rolling out electricity into the home. Right. And, and, okay. And is there something that would be considered the first home appliance that was using electricity? What oh, was man. there something? Yeah, and I'm trying, to, and I and I can't think of what it is, but uh, there is. But I wasn't ready for that. The, I, the, <laughs> no, no, the, there is. There is, and it wasn't the toaster. I have to get back. My, my mind's just got to run through the cabinet because um, uh, lots of personal hair products. We, but it seems like toasters. I think. I'm wondering if the first, if the heat, not, well, I don't know if you consider the, the, the first, the small heater, but it seemed like there was an appliance that was, 
Would it have been an iron? It might have been, but it okay. might have been a hair product too, like a, a a a curling iron or a flattening iron. But but also, of course, you know, there's refrigerators and there's. Oh, that's but true. I'm not thinking of those things, and I don't know what the chronology of that is, and, and washing machines, and um, and coffee pots, and uh, stove tops, and uh, you know, uh, hot plates. Uh, so I, I don't know what the what the first of that was. But just think about all those all those appliances as how what efficiency they brought into into life. Uh, what we take for granted, you know, a washing machine in a, in a, in a range top and things like that. And we just take it for granted. So that's, that's, that's interesting. Let's, yeah, let's go back. You said something and we weren't planning on talking about this, but the quack medicine. So when I think of quack medicine, I think a guy selling, you know, potions in, in, you know, snake oil, if you will, but what sort of quack medicine was using electricity? Gosh. So, boy, that's a big topic. And, uh, well, uh, early on with electricity, with electricity, and so they're playing with sparks and magnets and compasses, and they're starting to think, well, is this spark on my machine the same thing as a bolt of lightning in the sky? Uh, Is this a spark of life? You know, they're making a frog leg kick. The whole Mary Shelley, I mean, she's just watching Galvani and Volta do their demonstrations running electric current through, um, you know, um, and, you know, animal limbs and, and bigger and bigger animal limbs in front of bigger and bigger audiences and thinking, well, this leg is kicking and, you know, we're made of electricity. Could this be the spark of life? You know, these are, these are all actually at the time are actually great questions. Uh, they just, you know, when you investigate them, they bear different fruit. And another another thing was, well, is this is this got healing properties? Um, um, early on, uh, people were getting shocked with electricity or applying minor amounts of it and claiming making claiming making medical claims. And um, the placebo effect, which I think is profound, is having a great effect on a lot of people. Look, look when you when you apply electric charge to people for gout. Which it doesn't cure. I don't care what you know. It just doesn't cure. But people had gout, and fifty percent of your people say they feel better with the treatment. So you're going to make a lot of money. Wow. Okay. Right. But it doesn't cure gout. So, but it's being packaged in lots of ways. And we have lots of samples of that, from electric belts to craniology stuff that goes on your head, applying electric charges in different parts of your brain to uh, play up or play down different parts of your personality. It's fascinating. Uh, and um, a lot of physicians uh, hung their shingles. And actually, there's still, still some today, I think, that that um, um, <clears throat> use some of this technology in a way that it's just difficult to prove, especially when people, a, a lot of times they'll, they'll apply the electric charge, you'll get shocked. And then when you're done, they said, you, you know, you, you often say you feel better. And I think you often feel better because they turned it off. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but then you have to deal with that. So then you're trying to sort out well, what works and what doesn't. Well, you know, what does cure gout and what, you know, and so, um, so early on, especially at the time of Franklin and, and this Galvani with the frog leg thing, you know, like, well, I can reanimate matter. And it's like, no, you can't. That's not what's going on. What's what's going on is wondrous and amazing, and it's going to lead to the invention of the battery. Thank you, but it's not going to reanimate matter. You know, you're not going to get a Frankenstein. It's not. It's not how it's going to work. You know, we tried that, and so, and so, you know, that's and th- you know, these stories. These are our stories, man. Okay. When I get a bunch of kids in a room and I want to talk about some of this stuff, and I say, "Who's heard of Volta?" Nobody raises their hand. Who's heard of Galvani? Nobody's raised their hand. I say, who's heard of Frankenstein? Everybody raises. Everybody. People don't speak English. Raise their hand. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, we can all talk. Well, okay, let's talk. This is a good. This is a good question. You know, it's crazy. It's cool. Let's answer it. Let's go through it. It's fascinating. You know, we can do some science along the way. Wouldn't that be cool? Anyway. Okay, so. When you guys were open, it looked like on on the weekends you were doing this mega zapper show. Yeah. 
why explain it to me, please? Cause I don't understand why I could stand in that cage and not get electrocuted. Man. Isn't nature wonderful? <laughs> well, it's okay. The photography of what you guys are showing here is, is, is jaw droppingly cool. And, and Scott, but, Scott, sometimes someday uh, we'd love to have you get in the cage, take your camera with love with your loved ones, you know, and, and uh, see if you're really meant for each other and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and capture the moment on film. It's just a, uh, yeah. So how does it work? I mean, what's what's the science here? Um, well, let's see the science. Well, first off, um, uh, the the cage, the human bird cage, as we call it, and and the big mega zapper, the big Tesla coil, the nine foot Tesla coil. Versions of that demonstration have been done for years, and we did for years with with a bird cage and light bulbs, and smaller okay. Tesla coils, and. Uh, uh, you know, we'd always say, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could get in one of these cages and prove it, you know, and so then we built one, you know, that whole bit, but it's been done. But the, the idea is even Franklin a couple hundred years ago knew that, that an electric charge on a hollow conductor would stay on the outside of the conductor and, and actually repel off the, it, 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 almost think of it as like, um, I guess the best way for me to think of it as a non-electrical engineer is, you know, when you're working, get an electromagnetic field. And, you know, if you take two magnets, you know, you just, you know, it's so fun. You know, you just take two magnets, you know, and, you know, one side sticks. Right. And the other side. Repels. Repels. And I can't, I just won't let me, you know, mm -hmm. that invisible force will let me. Well, that force is on the outside of the cage. Oh. And it is literally repelling off there. And so that's how you count on that. That and so that's what's happening off of it. And and it, what it's trying to do, by the way, is is it's repelling off the off the conductor. It's going around the conductor. It's looking. You know, electricity is is not. You know, a lot of times people you know, try to give it personality. You know, like it's angry or it's got. It's I, sometimes I talk to about electricity like it's a person. But 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 of all things, you, you have to say about it is it's persistent. It's it does not hesitate, and it's insidious. And when that charge comes at you through that, it knows you're there, and it can't get you. And so it's going around trying to get you. And it's bouncing off the the the, the conductive material, and uh, uh, it's it's an odd phenomenon to watch it seek seek out the ground. And it's trying to get into the ground. It's trying to get it, it to conduct. It's trying to get to something that'll get it in, so it can. And 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 you'd be a great pathway, and that's what it's looking for. And so we give it a pathway with a cage and a grounding cable, uh, so that it just doesn't want you. But but if you were to take your finger and slowly stick it through the cage, which I can't even believe I'm saying, but we've got spotters watching and all that stuff. But I mean, as, as soon as as soon as you were able to get outside the cage with whatever, I don't care what it was, a needle, you know. As soon as that cage or that charge picked up the needle, it wouldn't care about the cage anymore. It'd be all about the needle and it'd be all about you. Right. And so oh. it just wants the first thing it comes to. It's uh, right. it's very predictable. And so, you know, um, so th this phenomenon, this, this Faraday cage effect, you know, or just repels is just, yeah, it, it, people do it with screens and in different forms all the time. A, a lot of your electrical devices uh, are protected with a Faraday, with a, what they call a Faraday cage of effect, where it's, it's, you know, sealed up in a conductive material. And so it, it, it's able to repel an electric charge. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a nine foot Tesla coil. And I'm going to guess that that just doesn't plug into a regular wall outlet. Pretty damn close though. Pretty really? damn close. Plugs in a 220. I was just thinking that today, which is what you use your washer and dryer with. It runs on 220, yeah. so my dryer, yep. I could I could go and get a nine foot Tesla coil and plug it in where my dryer plugs in. Well, I'd like to see, in, I'd be happy to help you hook that up, Scott. If you that ever <laughs> came to you, I don't know how much <laughs> I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a pretty efficient. Uh, it was built back by a guy named Jeff Parisi, who who, who actually built it for Cirque du Soleil. 
oh. uh, and was building us one. We, we wanted a big coil. We'd always been talking. We wanted a figure, a figure piece. So it's figure demonstration. Uh, uh, um, I don't know what you, a signature demonstration. That's what I mean. Gotcha. Uh, and we thought, well, the mega zapper and this whole phenomenon would, would be a great, a great show. And um, uh, so we contacted a guy, Jeff Breezy, and he, he builds them. And, and he was building us one, and he had just built this one for, for Cirque du Soleil. And they had a, a very, a really awful accident almost right away in their rehearsals. And, oh. and they canceled their electric-themed show, whatever it was, and gave him back his coil. So he contacted us and said, would you like to buy a similar coil only slightly used? And, and <laughs> low mileage, and, yeah, low mileage, only one kill, and uh, no, nobody, nobody was, nobody was killed, but someone was really, really hurt, and and so we bought it, and and but by the way, when when we got that, we we realized what what a great machine it was. I mean, that it was you know definitely professional and big quality and everything we wanted, but also how dangerous it was and how we we're going to roll out a show. I don't just do the weekend shows too; I do the weekend shows to the general public, but. All during the week, I, I do I do school groups or did school groups or will do school groups again. So I'm, I we use that coil virtually every day, and uh, to roll it out in front of 100 150 people, you know, hit the lights. I got five year olds and grandma and people with all kinds of uh, from all, all walks of life, you know, and, and to be to to know that I'm able to do this in a safe way and have everybody have a fun spectacular time is it's great. It's great. So um, yeah. So, so how long? How long does somebody stay in the cage? Oh, how long does the oh, how long is the show? Yeah, well, well, the show itself, you know, depending on how long we, you know, what the buildup is and what the demonstrations are around that, um, you know, actually the, you know, getting inside the cage. So there's an audience here. You see the big cage. It's a large cage. It actually holds four to six people. The cage. Oh wow. Big. Okay. And then there's the big coil. And there's a fence and. And then usually I do other coils before that, and maybe the bird cage is a demonstration, so you get a sense of what we're about to do, and you know take it up a notch, so to speak, and then reveal the big cage, and then have people step inside, and then reveal the the coil, and then you know do the wind up, and then fire it off. So we use it, but we fire the coil, and, and you know in fifteen second, that's a long time. Yeah, that 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 would be. It's loud. Um... It's you know. It's like, but it's. It's like a roller coaster. It's like a jet engine, and uh, and uh, yeah, a little, a little. You know, it's we, we try to we try to to place it well so that so that um, so that uh, you know a little bit goes a long way with something that sure. big. So we try to really, uh, but but something else too is you know, we're, and we're proud about the coil. And I love the coil. I mean, the big mega zapper, but I've got six mm-hmm. as the coils, and to be honest. If you were if you were here for like five minutes or ten minutes, and you said, "I, Tana, you you can only show me one thing. You can only give me one demonstration. What would it be?" I wouldn't do that. I, 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 I it would be in the top five, but I'd do the singing Tesla coil, which is hanging from the ceiling, where I can play the theme from. I mean, I can play the theme from Star Wars or Hall of the Mountain King or. Frankenstein, or uh, uh, you know, I mean, I've got a singing Tesla coil that's much like a theremin, except when it's blasting out electrical energy and throwing out sparks, it's doing it to a particular tune. So, okay, you heard? I've it. Never heard of? That. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. They're called the Zoom and you, you wrecked my question because I was going to ask you what your favorite thing was, and you just kind of answered it, so you didn't wreck it. But that's awesome. No. But tell me more about the singing Tesla coil. I mean, I've never heard of anything like Gosh. that. Yeah. No, they're, um, matter of fact, I was going to film, film it uh, some today. So, uh, um, so just like, um, so when you hear a, a theremin, you know, it's, it's, um, it's throwing out bursts of electrical energy. Uh, it's, it's usually fairly loud and it's kind of a, eh, you know, frequency. Well, well, the long and the short of it is um, about 20, 25 years ago, um, some uh, electrical engineers figured out a way to control the frequency uh, of, the, of the Tesla coil. So much like a theremin just makes like a, just instead of an eh sound, you're able to take the pitch up and down. Well, that's what they did with the theremin. Instead of that scratch, it's able to take it up and down and dial in so you can dial in notes. 
And so uh, myself or my colleagues will step up. My, the president and CEO, John Jenkins, the founder of the museum, one of his favorite things to do is step up. He plays it pretty good, too. He plays Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix like nobody's business. That would be cool. On the same okay. coil. I mean, he just knocks that out. And so when you catch the arc, you're able to pull the note, and it's, uh, it's a spectacular. That's my show. That's what I close every show with. Because after that, I got nothing to show you. <laughs> That's what I tell them. So, so this is a relatively recent invention, if you will, or use of the Tesla coil is th- this to turn it into a, a a musical device, if you will. Uh, see, yes, a singing coil, and like they like Burning Man. I think there's a guy who does one at Burning Man or something. The big ones. I've seen dueling banjo kind of singing coils. Oh wow! Uh, okay, and so and so. Um, they're called zeusophones and, um, uh, or, you know, different terms like that. But I often call them singing Tesla coils, and they're they're kind of a novelty, uh, a variation on on the on the coil, and uh, uh, to make music with it is, yeah, it's memorable. It's memorable. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to coming and seeing that. So, before we push the button to record, we, you mentioned something about. Edison 78s being proprietary in the whole recorded music thing. Mm-hmm. What when did when did um when did vinyl records come out? Uh when when was because when I was a kid and those Edison um the tubes up behind you, I I can see behind your head and on top of the bookcase you've got some old Oh, Edison, uh, yeah, cylinders. So, when did it go from cylinders to to vinyl platters? Well, it went from. I mean, they use different materials, uh, but the cylinders, um, again, are, are meant to much to emulate. You know, the, the the style of the Edison cylinder phonographs look much like music boxes. And if you look at the cylinder on a music box, instead of the pins, this has got a groove. But I mean, that that design, you know, that's originally, that's why we have vintage music boxes next to the Edison cylinders to show you that evolution and, and what people are thinking. And so, okay. um, so they, they, they must have gone flat sometime, I would think, like in the 20s. In the 20s? In the 20s. Maybe. Or you mean... Flat, just basic records. Yeah, just flat, 78s. Yeah, that was in the early 20s. Early 20s. Early, early 20s, 1918. So, you know? All right, so, so this is like 1902. And this is like 120. Okay. This is like 120 revolutions a minute. Then you get 78s, oh. right? 78s look like 33 and a thirds, except 78s are one song. 33 and a mm-hmm. thirds is like five songs, right? I mean, you know, you, you, hold, up, you hold up the old 70. So that these got flattened out. But then, but then they weren't really vinyl. They didn't really go to vinyl, I think, until they went to, to albums, to the 33 and a thirds. And there was an overlap because we've got a, like a, we've got a vintage uh, uh, world uh, music box from 1938. And that, okay. and that, that holds 78s. That holds 78s. Yeah, so artists, yeah. But I, I think, but the, 30, the, 40, the 33 and a third and the 45s, I think came out more in the 40s. So that cylinder, how much audio does that hold? Is that just a song? Yeah. So maybe three to five minutes? Two and four minutes. The black ones are two minutes. Oh. And there's some blue okay. ones that, that run for four minutes. Oh, okay. And that's the cylinder. The song title is on the end. And just, right. yeah, it just goes on a, on a machine very similar to a, a shape of a music box with a horn on it. Right. Yeah, you were you had a video that you were playing one, um, and you didn't have the horn on. Right. And I was I was it was very interesting to me to watch that because you started playing you know you put the needle down, and then you you put the megaphone on and it made the volume was in, was incredible. That's the best. So that's the best part of the demonstration. We we do that always on purpose. Now we always have the horn on the side because we used to just have it on before. Yeah, it's it's very dramatic when that goes on. Everybody kind of goes wow. Yeah, it really wasn't a a, a, a very drastic improvement right. to the to the quantity. So, 
so what I, I, one of the questions I've been asking people as we wrap things up, putting you on the spot here, I'm going to paint a scenario and here's the scenario. Everybody is in the museum is safe, but you have to leave the museum and you can only take one thing with you. What would be the one thing in the museum you would take? In the museum? Yeah, well, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I would probably take the most, <laughs> this is crazy, but I think this is what I do. I take the most priceless thing in the museum. And the most priceless thing in the museum is the Edison light bulb, which was the first incandescent light bulb. For, it's, you know, it's just unbelievably rare. So I would take that light bulb and I would take it. But here's the problem. It's a burned out light bulb. It's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, right? It's like, if you steal it, like it's a burned out light bulb. What good is it? Well, that's why the, what makes it what it is, is the story and the history. Okay. And the context. That's what makes it priceless. Right. Okay. And so, so I feel odd about the one thing I would take would be a burned out light bulb, but that's what I'm taking. Okay. <laughs> and, I think, well, and you were not prepared for that question. No, no, so that, I, we'll, we'll, we'll allow that answer. And, that's a, that's a great answer. And I think when the smoke Just, clears and my bosses go, yeah, yeah, I was all right. They, I, I might get chewed out, but I, I've been chewed out before. <laughs> okay. All right. So as we wrap up, why don't you, why don't you tell our audience where they can find more about the museum and, uh, and then ultimately at some point you'll be open to the public again, but where, where can, if they want to go find out more about, about you guys, where can they find you? Well, I mean, we're certainly, you know, we have a website, it's a spark museum, uh, www.sparkmuseum.org or Facebook. You, well, um, I mean, say where we can, they can find us. Um, well, are, so you have you have a Facebook a Facebook page. You've got your website. Yeah, yeah. Are you on any other social media platforms? Uh, are you on Instagram? I believe we're on Instagram, but I'm, I'm yes, I believe we're on Instagram. But I have okay. every other information on that at the moment. Other people handle that. Um, again, I said I'm the custodian, so uh, I'm more <laughs> tied to the bathrooms. But yes, they can reach us that way. And of course, you know, um, by by calling the museum. Uh, you know, our, we've got a big chunk of real estate in downtown Bellingham, and um, We'll be opening as soon as it's safe to do so. We already have plenty of safety things. In, 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 we're all, we've always been concerned about safety here, obviously, dealing with the equipment we have and sanitation and so forth, doing all the school groups. So, But we've taken up a notch, and we'll let everybody know. And we're just – our docents are more excited than ever to share the collection with the students, the kids, the community. And um, – we really appreciate Scott. You're you're showing some interest in us. We, we really do, and we look forward to having you come visit, and and uh, have you give a great give you a great time. I, I'm looking forward to uh, coming over to Bellingham and, and taking a look at this. Um, it looks fascinating to me, and I think, um, I think it'll be. Well, I'm, I know we didn't cover a lot of topics about what you guys have there, so that's part of it. You've got to come and see some of the other stuff that you have that's really cool. But I'm really looking forward to, to coming and, and taking a look through the through the museum. And I don't know if I'll stand inside the cage, but I might. You know, I mean, that's that's pretty spectacular looking. That visually, that's pretty spectacular looking. Well, so. No matter how you do it, you know, you don't have to go in to have a great time. That's all, you know. But oh, but yeah. but, uh, but it's an unusual experience to see. And again, you know, like we talked about earlier, earlier the, the, the great thing about our jobs here is we have such dynamic equipment to work with, and it's it's a lot easier to let the lightning do the talking for you. So uh, that's what I'm really looking forward to, to having you actually see some of this and not just hear about it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, very enjoyable for me, and so I'm sure people will enjoy listening to it or have enjoyed listening to it. And uh Guys, go take a look at the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention in Bellingham. I think it's going to be worth your time. Thanks a lot. Love to have you. Okay. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.